Hey, welcome. Thanks for joining me. We are continuing our look at uh, Colossians, and we're in chapter 2. We're going through verses 1 through 7 uh, this week. And I didn't get to do one. Well, actually, I did do a video yesterday, verses 4 and 5. But when I when I went to put it, upload it, uh, it was all done in slow motion. So it was like an hour and 10 minutes long. So that didn't work. Uh, so, <laughs> So I didn't know that until about 11 o'clock last night as I kept trying to get it loaded, trying to get it loaded. Couldn't figure out what was wrong until I actually watched the video. I was like, oh, it's in slow motion. No wonder. And it was interesting because everything was like, that kind of stuff. But, but uh, and, and I certainly don't talk slowly like that. So we have to go back. We have to do all verse 4 and 5 and then 6 and 7 today. And Paul was talking about... Um, uh, wisdom and knowledge that are found in Jesus Christ. And it is this knowing who you are in Christ, knowing who Jesus is, that he is the treasure. He is he, he also opened, he himself is the treasure, but he opens the door to further treasures uh, that are to be found in him. And wisdom and knowledge, all wisdom and, and knowledge is to be found in him. And so he's already said that. And now he says, I say this in order that no one may delude you or deceive you with persuasive speech or argumentation. Um, I like speech better. Uh, it's not necessarily argument. The word does mean speech. Uh, and, and, it's, and he says that is persuasive speech. Uh, we don't have a problem seeing those things that are obviously wrong, seeing those things that are obviously incorrect, those things that are obviously a contradiction. Um, as believers, we don't have trouble with that. Now, unbelievers have all kinds of problems with not seeing contradictions uh, that, because that, that's prevalent in our society today, and we could look at any number of things. But by persuasive arguments, arguments or speech or language that sounds like it might be right, like love is love or... Um, it doesn't matter as long as you love one another. It doesn't matter as long as there is adult consent. And and really, you want the health of children above everything. And so uh, children have the right to uh, mutilate themselves and change their gender as if that's a possibility. And these are the topics that are being talked about today. Um, and it sounds, maybe that could be right until you bring it to the gospel, until you bring it to the word of God. And there we find in Jesus Christ all knowledge and wisdom, and everything is measured by him. Everything is judged by him of who he is uh, and who we are in him and how we are to live. And then he says, for even though I am absent in body, and I love this, even though I'm absent in body, which of course he was because he was in jail in Ephesus, um, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit. How is he with them in spirit? Well, the Spirit is with Paul, and in Paul, as Paul prays, and as they gather, and the Spirit is with them and within them, there is this being together in the Spirit. And so I think that's pretty cool, that no matter where you are, you can be with other believers, and that should be a unifying thing with the church. As the church gathers on Sunday, not just Troy First Baptist, but whatever the church name might be that is a Bible-believing church, that as we are worshiping and as we are praying, as we are giving praise to God in the spirit, that we are joined with other believers who are doing the same thing. And to me, that's awesome. There is a tremendous unity there that should be discussed. It should be talked about and I think is missed quite often uh, when we, we talk about our differences rather than the things that unify us. And certainly one of those things that unifies us is the spirit. Uh, that, that when we're together, we're to, whether we're there personally with one another, uh, worshiping, or whether it's another church congregation altogether, that when we're gathered in the name of Jesus to worship God through Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God is there within us and is present with us, and so that we are together and uni unified in that worship and praise. And so, and the same thing is true individually. Uh, Mary and I, when we're on vacation, we miss Sunday. We miss. I miss being with this congregation. I miss miss being here with with my people. And though we're in a church somewhere else and worshiping there, as we worship there in spirit, we worship here uh, with Troy First Baptist as well. I just think that's cool. I think that's an awesome way of looking at it. And Paul rejoices to see uh, their good discipline or their good order and the stability of their faith in Christ. So he rejoices to see that that good, good discipline 
Uh, it is uh, standing in good order. It's taxis. It's a military term for being in, in rank and file, being in good order. But it was also being in order listening to your commanding officer. In this case, it would be Jesus Christ. Listening to the command of Christ to move or to go. Uh, and it's a wonderful thing to think of the church, the congregation, standing in order, listening for the master, listening. Uh, now, are there officers underneath the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, of course there are. We're, uh, he's the great shepherd. Pastors are under shepherds to the great shepherd. Or he is the king. We're the officers under him. And, and we are to lead the congregation as, as he leads us. Uh, we as Southern Baptists, however, believe that the congregation, uh, congregationalism, although that gets gets kind of crazy sometimes, I do believe that pastoral authority has its place. I do believe that there should be that. Although I believe in a multiplicity of elders, I think I think churches should be uh, run by elders, led by elders. I think it's under the, under Christ and it's under the gospel. But I think there should be a group of elders that uh, are decision makers in the, in in the church, but. That's for another day. Um, but right now, he rejoices seeing them in good order uh, and the stability of their faith, which means it's, it's on firm foundation. It's not wobbly like weebles that wobble and don't fall down, not blown by every wind that comes along. It's stable. It's solid. And uh, uh, their faith in Christ, it's not shifting. It's not shaking. Then he moves on to verses 6 and 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus as the Lord, so walk in him. Uh, if you've received Christ, and therefore, uh, as you therefore have received Christ, and so they are surrendered to Jesus, not only as Savior, but to Lord. As you have received him, this is, you've received him, this is a past tense thing, it's already taken place, doesn't have to happen again. Uh, as you've received him, walk in him. This is a command. Uh, that it's an imperative. We are to walk. And now what is that? Walk, of course, is a metaphor for the conduct of life. Within the Jewish mind, it had to do with ethical behavior, uh, right behavior. Behavior that corresponds to our surrender to Jesus as Lord. So Paul says that a stable faith has to do with a surrendered walk. Uh, a stable faith is is found by a surrendered walk. So he ties everything up here. You're surrendered to Jesus not only as as Savior, but as Lord. Notice that what he says, though. As you therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. So he's the crucified Messiah. He is the Messiah. He's the crucified Jesus, but he's also the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And so you surrender him uh, as Lord, and he becomes your Savior, which means you are surrendered to him uh, in everything in our lives. We're surrendered to him. Uh, and, and do we do that perfectly? No, but it should be consistently that we, sur we are surrendered to him always, but we don't always live it out. Walking in him, and so walk means the way of our way of life, our way of conducting ourselves, our behavior. Um, it should correspond to our, uh, our being surrendered to Jesus Christ, and that we have received him as Lord and Savior, that we have faith in him. We've accepted the promise uh, or the gospel promise that in him is life and the forgiveness of sin. We are, are baptized by the Holy Spirit, put into Christ, and we, that's symbolized by being baptized in water, that, which shows that that is a reality in our lives, that we belong to Jesus Christ. And if we do, then our lives should correspond, our behavior, our conduct should correspond to that statement of faith that we are believers in Christ. And so as we walk, and that carries the idea of, of peripateo, carries the of walk of life, how we walk, how we live. And, but if you, if you keep the metaphor, one of the things that we can say is, okay, if I'm walking this way is, and the Lord is in me, if Christ Jesus is in me, should I be going into this place? Should I be going with these people? Should I be in this situation? Should I be uh, a part of this? And so that raises those questions for us. That, that and there, there it comes back to this deception thing. Am I being deceived? Am I, am I being duped here? Uh, and we have to come back to the whole thing. Uh, if Jesus is, would he approve of my being here? Would he approve? Uh, should, would I take Jesus with me into this place, into this thing, into this behavior, into this conduct? And that, that becomes the question, doesn't it? Uh, and then, um, so walking him, and in verse 7, 
having been firmly rooted, a passive, uh, a perfect passive, which means it took place in the past, it was done to you, you have been rooted in Christ. That's a once and it's over with thing. It doesn't have to be done again. Um, you can, it goes back to, can someone lose their salvation? No, not if you're genuinely saved. If you're genuinely saved, there is no such thing, well, I was saved, I'm not saved, I was saved, I'm not, I am saved, I'm not saved, that kind of thing. Either you are or you are not. And so, uh, and, 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 and you're the only one that can answer that question. I can answer that question for you. Either you are or you are not. Either you believe in Christ or you don't. Either you surrender to him as Lord or you're not. Um, I, can't, I can't answer that for you. Uh, but we're to keep on walking him. That, that's a present tense, to keep on walking uh, and living a life that is, uh, that is in, in uh, that, that matches, that corresponds to our statement of faith in Christ Jesus. Um, and so that goes back to Colossians 1.10, what, what Paul had said there, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, worthy of him, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing the knowledge of God. Um, and then he says this, having been firmly rooted, and he sort of changes the metaphor, being built up in him. So being rooted is a completed past action that carries over into the future. But the being built up is a present tense passive. You are being built up uh, brick by brick into this uh, building. Uh, and and it, is, it is them together, the congregation together, uh, being built up brick by brick. And so you have that being uh, built up in him, in Christ. So you're firmly rooted in Christ. You're being built up in Christ and established in your faith or uh be, be secure in your faith, being secured in your faith, um, so that you're not shaking. You have security, and I think we need that. We need to have that security of faith, to know that we are loved by God, to know that we're saved by Christ, uh, by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, that we're saved, truly rescued out of sin and death, and that God loves us, and he's put us on this trajectory, this path that is going to be like Jesus Christ, and he's working that out in us, and, and we're to be cooperating with the Spirit and, and surrendering over and over on a daily basis, and in, in every moment and every thought and every deed is taken captive to, to Christ, um, and so, yes, we want that to happen in our lives, but we want to be secure. We want to have that security. And as you know who you are in Christ, as you know who Christ is, and you, you believe the gospel, then you have that security rather than that insecurity. Um, and he says, just as you were taught. You, you were taught these things. You were instructed these things. Uh, and because of that, you overflow with gratitude. So N.T. Wright has a wonderful thing. I, I'm going to quote it to you uh, from his uh, commentary on Colossians. He says, Christians walking in Christ by being well-rooted like a tree, solidly built like a house, confirmed and settled like a legal document, overflowing like a jug full of wine. Each of these images nevertheless has its own point to make. He said, Paul, how do you hold these things together? Yet each one has its point. I would argue, however, and I think N.T. Wright would agree as it came to this later on, um, is that what we have is creation... Uh, metaphor being used and being rooted, that that's a creation idea. And that um, the uh, being built up is, is temple idea. And you put those two together, is it temple or is it, or is it creation? And I think it's both. And you get to uh, Revelation 21 and 22, you see creation, you see the Holy of Holies, you see all of that in the new city that comes down to earth. Uh, in this new creation, and you have the that the dwelling of God with man, and that's restored. What was lost in Eden is restored in the end of the new creation. And I think that's the metaphors that Paul has in mind. The whole new creation, the whole um, the whole continuation of the thing, rooted, built up, the new temple uh, that, that we are the temple of God, that the people of God are the temple of God, that kind of thing, and and that will be with us. That He has tabernacled with us, and that that will be there in the new creation, and I think that's ultimately what he's talking about. And then overflowing with gratitude. The church should be overflowing with gratitude because of what God has done for us, who Jesus is, who we are in Christ. All of that leads to this gratitude of worship and praise to God with thankful hearts, overflowing with thankfulness. Uh, and the Christian life should be filled with thanksgiving. We should be overflowing with thanksgiving. 
uh, and joy, indescribable, uh, but expressed with thankfulness, a heart full of thankfulness that overflows in praise to God and in love for others and in love for Christ and, and, and a hatred of sin and what it does to people uh, and, and being solid, being com- solid in our faith and secure in who we are in Jesus Christ without insecurity. Well, we're going to tie all this up Sunday. If you don't have a church home, we'd love for you to come and be a part of the worship at Troy First Baptist. We believe God is doing great things here in our midst. We'd love for you to be a part of that. Uh, also, um, uh, if you don't, if you can't do that, then, then be we. You can watch us online, uh, either on our Facebook page or our website or on our YouTube uh, channel. You can you can be a part of worship that way. Um, also, if you have, a, if you want to be part of a fellowship, part of a small group where you can meet people and you get to know people and you can study God's Word together, we have small groups for every age. We would love for you to come be a part of that. Our small groups are at 9 o'clock. Our worship is at 1015. We'd love for you to be our guest at Troy First Baptist Church. Hey, listen, I pray that you know the love of God in Christ Jesus. He loves us. God loves us. And Jesus loves us so much that he came gave himself that we might have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and joy indescribable right here, right now. I pray that that's yours. And if it is, then you know the gift that the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, wants to give you, and that is his shalom, the shalom of God. Complete, whole, everything, nothing lacking. I pray that that's yours, my friend. Hey, listen, we're going to wrap all this up Sunday. Uh, I pray that you can be here. If not, I'll see you Monday as we continue our look at Colossians. Till then, I pray that God's peace rests upon you, your home, your family, your loved ones, always. Until we meet again, shalom, my friend.